You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com please welcome to the oic stage jill malandrino and her fellow panelists you Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ and also the host of NASDAQ Trade Talks that you guys all saw as you came into the conference this week. And it's been really interesting hosting a number of these conversations that we've had and listening in on the panels, because as my panelists will agree, we're seeing a lot of the positive themes for 2018 relative to 2017. And of course, with volatility and volume back into the market, that lends to the conversations around investor education, uh, promoting market maker and liquidity issues um, that's prevalent in the industry and uh, ETFs really um, in the forefront of the options business as well as other introduction of products and that all comes back to innovation and technology which leads the way for us to have these conversations without that it doesn't allow market structure in our industry to evolve. So I'd love to introduce my panel. I have Pete Maragos, who's the co-founder and CEO of Dash Financial. Then we have Travis McGee, he's the Vice President of Business Development over at TradeStation. And Tony Zhang, he's the Head of Product Strategy over Options Play. So we're gonna take a look at the innovation in the options industry through the institutional retail advisor and product uh, lens. So I'd love to kick it off with you, Pete, and um, the evolution of trading technology from um, the product perspective has really been something to follow. Absolutely. First of all, I'd like to thank the OIC and NASDAQ for throwing this fantastic event. I know that I've, I've certainly had a great time and uh, it's been good to get together. Yeah, no, I, I mean, from my perspective, my, um, I guess what I'm gonna bring to this panel is the, in the, uh, the perspective of the institutional, um, you know, execution space and how, how we're using technologies and, um, and, um, and new tools, okay, to help institute the institutional investor. Um, and that's, that'll be the perspective. Though. All right, so. and Travis, we'll turn it over to you with the Active Retail Trader. Sure, absolutely, and thanks again, uh, obviously, for uh, making me a part of this, and good seeing Pete and Tony and you, Jill. Um, yeah, so my focus uh, with TradeStation obviously is more on the retail side, self-directed investing. Uh, you know, what I'm you know, looking at uh, really is uh, the evolution of the past 10 years, what got us to where we are now, uh, particularly as it pertains to the retail client and, and how they're accessing the options market. Uh, you know, obviously one of the big trends now is mobile technology, and that's where we put a lot of time and effort is um, not uh, so much being a place for the customer to come, but going to where the customer is and allowing them to access options wherever they may be. Uh, and then also looking out into the next five or 10 years and how that technology is changing uh, and what we need to do to stay in front of that innovative curve. All right, and Tony, from the retail and advisor perspective, you're making options accessible to everyone through options play. Yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Thanks to the OCC and NASDAQ. Uh, my name is Tony Zhang. I am the chief strategist at Options Play, um, and our mission here is very simple, to make options as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. Um, so I'll be providing uh, some perspective from the retail and financial advisor's perspective of trading technology here today. Um, you know, our firm builds uh, options analytics tools for the sell-side firms that service retail uh, self-directed clients and financial advisors. I think what's interesting with our panel, um, when you look at innovative technologies, it lends to uh, more transparent and efficient markets. And that's what all of us and what you guys do is responsible for moving the options industry ahead. So let's talk about that um, transparency and more efficient markets and, and how you're doing that over at Dash. Absolutely, I mean at Dash, I think that you know, we, you know, early on in our history, we came out and you know, kind of took the perspective that show the customer everything, okay, as far as what's going on with the order, when they sent it, what was the market data before and after, all the different child slices, and, and really showing people the market structure itself and how it's evolving through the life cycle of the order. 
and we kind of originally when we did it, we did it just to a to be you know different, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, you know, and, and obviously you know uh, you know show people exactly what's going on because we, we thought there was a deficit of that happening in the marketplace. But what happened as a byproduct of that it w is a really wonderful thing is that once we saw that we were showing people what was going on and what we were doing it, it created this feedback loop. Okay, where people said, wow, that's how you're treating my order. And this, well, in these stocks, at this time of day, I want it handled this way. And in, you know, in, in this portfolio, I want things done a little differently. And by, by being transparent, it's created a, a, a great feedback loop and, a, and, a, and a, to create a consultative approach where then we can then tailor the solution for the customer's benefit, where they A, understand it, and then B, we've altered it to suit them. So they really feel like they've had input and that product is their own. So you know, transparency really, I think it just unleashes you know, a lot of benefits to the end user. And Travis, how do you translate that into the active trader? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Pete hits on a great point there. And uh, the key is understanding, right? Because if you understand something, by and large, you're going to be more confident. Uh, and with the retail investor, it's confidence is everything, giving them the confidence they need uh, to incorporate options uh, into their portfolio. Uh, even on the active trader side, with a lot of our active traders, we by and large, we see a lot of folks who are primarily, uh, you know, into that uh, pure equity market, uh, whether long or short, but they, they really haven't incorporated options yet. So uh, getting them to understand, uh, a lot of that hinges on, obviously, uh, education, uh, putting, uh, as you know, we work together closely and putting uh, together an educational package for everyone as they come in uh, to understand uh, the power of options, so understanding the product, uh, but also understanding our product, understanding all the tools uh, that uh, we at TradeStation spend so much time developing, you know, what, what that provides you, what type of color and clarity that is. It's, it's a little different than the institutional client in many cases where, you know, the retail they're looking at the world a little differently, and they don't necessarily understand all of the analytics, what they're supposed to do, what it means to their portfolio. Uh, so we have to get out in front of that. Um, so while having the tools is nice and the innovative technology, you, you have to back that up with support and understanding to get people actively using that product. Tony, I love what you say when you explain options play. It's almost like taking a phone book for new retail options traders, and you have to find all your information here, but it's in Greek. Right. So elaborate on that. <laughs> right. So um, when we look at the retail market and how they interact with the, the markets, it's really isolated to their trading platform and the tools that they use to research, unlike uh, the tools that uh, the institutional side may have with uh, transparency. The retail customer doesn't necessarily always have that. Um, and if you look at the user experience, uh, and we, when we look at trading platforms that, that the retail trader and financial advisors interact with, um, the innovations there really comes from user experience, making that user experience as efficient as possible. So if we look at equities, we see uh, everything from the visualization and screening process to uh, make research uh, time down from a few hours or minutes down to just a few seconds. And then couple that with a workflow that allows a user to go from idea to trade execution with as few steps as possible on as many devices as possible. And this is all focused around user experience, making that as easy as an efficient as possible. But on the options side, it's a little more complex because there's a huge educational hurdle that needs to be overcome before someone can start taking a look at options. So everyone here on this panel and probably most people in this room learned how to trade options using an option chain because that was the only thing we really had. But if you look at the user experience of that, it's actually quite cumbersome. Uh, it's kind of like handing someone a phone book and saying everything you need is in here. You just have to go and figure out how to navigate it. And by the way, it's also written in Greek. Um, it's really a non-starter for a lot of beginners. So if we want to innovate in this space and we want more people to trade this market, we need to start looking at how can we change the user experience of options. And one of the things that we do is we ask a very simple question. You know, We don't use a phone book today anymore because we simply go and search for the things that we need. So we simply ask, are you bullish or are you bearish on a stock? And we can present strategies that make sense for that outlook and present it to you in visual, clean design format, couple that with plain English to make it easier to understand, and this really helps facilitate the learning, the exploration, and ultimately the trading of options. Well, innovation spurs innovation, but there also comes industry challenges with that as well. What are some of the challenges that you hear? I mean, as always, I, I think that the you know, liquidity is always a concern, you know, across the, uh, you know, across the landscape. And uh, I think that, you know, I think there's a lot of great technology on the institutional side and the retail side addressing it. But I think just in general, people always worry, am I getting the best price? You know, have I achieved the optimal result? Did my order have the proper footprint? 
you know, an impact on the marketplace. And I, and I just think that, you know, those are, those are consequences. I mean, obviously there's market structure, you know, you know, issues and inefficiencies that we have. And, but at the same time, I would say we have the most robust, you know, and, uh, and, and most beneficial to the end user market structure, you know, in the, in, in the world by far. But as always, people are, people want to do better. I think that, you know, uh, performance has been challenged over the years, especially on the active management side and really, you know, helping people, you know, get tools to uh, interact with liquidity in a cost effective manner, I think is, is, is always a headline concern. Well, Travis, that was one of the common issues that we heard at OIC for 2018 was liquidity and cost of capital. How does that impact the active trader? Does it trickle down to them at all? Are these concerns that you hear at Trade Station? Yeah, I mean, not, not as much. Um, you know, liquidity obviously uh, can be a concern. I mean, you look back on some of the events, um, particularly over the past five years, you think about February 5th, you think about uh, August a few years back, uh, and some of those uh, moves where liquidity starts to dissipate, uh, and that obviously creates some fears and, and tension among the retail investor, it creates more calls coming into the queue, and just overall questions, uh, you know, do you generally have to address? I mean, one of, it's still, I mean, one of the main obstacles and challenges that we have with the retail uh, investor is, uh, Again, understanding the product, but understanding the actual tool that they are using. You know, most of the people that are coming to us, you know, this is not their full-time job. You know, it's not even their part-time job. A lot have had uh, money with a financial advisor uh, for 30-plus years, and they're just now dipping their toes into the space. And they might have heard about options from a friend at a dinner party or whatever, so they want to start to dabble in that arena. So. Uh, you know, coming in, I think, you know, Tony, you know, made a great statement and, you know, making it as simple as, um, you know, are you, are you bullish or bearish on the stock? Uh, you know, we have to take that into account and we're trying to adapt our platform uh, to be, you know, designed in such an intuitive way that it, it's that simple for an individual to come in and it gets them over the hurdle that much quicker. You know, that, that's our primary challenge is getting them to actually place a trade uh, in shortening that time frame from opening an account and funding it to actually placing uh, that first trade. And a lot of that comes with trying to simplify the technology uh, so that when they, they see the market more clearly, they see the products more clearly, it's as simple as, okay, I understand what I'm doing. Uh, the platform makes sense. I'm going to execute the order. How do you think investors reacted during the volatility event on February 5th? Do you think they had enough of the education behind them to, to handle it better than they might have with the lack of technology and education, say, 10 years ago? Yeah, I think they handled it very well. I, I think the retail uh, base, uh, from what we saw at TradeStation, uh, uh, did extremely well considering uh, the magnitude of the move. I mean, I know in, in many cases it was isolated to particular products. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, uh, I think someone had mentioned in, in an earlier panel, you know, there's a lot of emotion uh, with, with retail investors, which is very true. Uh, and with the speed of news and how things flow through the markets now and how quickly we access it, um, you know, S XIB and S SVXY, uh, when that took place, that, that created a lot of fear uh, across, you know, all retail investors to where, you know, we encountered a number of questions. How does this impact the overall market? You know, I was trading options on these products, or I'm trading options on similar products. You know, what does that mean for me? So it, it's a learning experience. Um, you know, so it, you know, I again to answer your question, I think the the market handled it fairly right. well, all things considered. All right, and Tony, let's move beyond uh, 2018 when I had you on for trade talks. We were looking at machine learning in the cloud and so forth, and how we can integrate that into retail options trading platforms. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, machine learning is certainly an interesting topic that everyone is throwing around. We're seeing companies in all different industries pop up applying machine learning to it. Um, and I think there's no doubt that machine learning will be an integral part of this industry going in the next five or ten years. But I do think that before we kind of start speculating on what we're going to apply machine learning to and how we're going to apply it, we should really take a step back and better understand what types of machine learning algorithms are out there because the decision makers that are currently trying to apply machine learning, I feel is, or at least there's some misconception as to what machine learning can do. Um, you can't simply just throw a bunch of data at it and hope that it'll be able to provide you with insight and analytics to better do, uh, better uh, run your business. Um, it's important to understand that at this point, the types of machine learning algorithms that are available to the general public is classification machine learning algorithms, which are good at solving certain types of 
of problems and not very good at solving different other types of problems. And that's really important to understand what types of problems it's not good at solving because we don't want to spend all our times and, and capital to effectively spin our wheels because that is what you can do with machine learning if you're not applying it correctly. So I think we need to stay, take a step back, understand what types of problems we're trying to solve. I think some of the things that we've brought up at this conference regarding liquidity, re regarding transparency, these there are different parts of this types of problems that can be solved by machine learning. So we just have to take a step back, understand what the problem is before we start applying machine learning to everything. All right, and uh, Pete, I was gonna start that as well. Yeah, I'll jump in on that one really quick. I mean, I think that the capabilities of machine learning, I, th I think are, I think it's evolutionary, not revolutionary. I mean, just like everything, it's not, it's not gonna be big bang and all of a sudden everybody's gonna rip out all their technology and, and adopt new. I mean, but I think, you know, at least for us at Dash and, you know, in, in the institutional perspective that we had, you know, it's about using machine learning to make our routers smarter. You know, things that we used to be kind of set statically or based on data sets that we would analyze and, um, and maybe set on a daily, weekly, or monthly level. Now we're doing those things more dynamically, you know, intraday using, and so it's just about using a new technology to make things more dynamic and make the routers more smarter that can deliver, I would say, deterministic value to the end user. And I think that, you know, being able to drink 20 years of data in real time and, and come up with some, you know, so, some simple signals that help us make better decisions within our smart routers, you know, can deliver real value every day. All right, and I'll pass it off to you as well, Travis. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, a number of great points made here. Again, uh, to Tony's point, you know, finding what that problem is and then applying machine learning uh, to a solution or as a solution for that problem. Um, you know, at TradeStation, you know, we're putting a, a large number of uh, investment dollars uh, in time and effort and resources into uh, artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning. Uh, the problem for us, uh, again, is uh, simplifying investing for the retail investor. You know, uh, uh, the speed at which they can come onto the platform uh, and, and readily trade the markets. Uh, in a number of scenarios like that, it's, it's a matter of, you know, what do I trade and how do I trade it? Uh, and how do I adapt my portfolio over time as market dynamics uh, start to change? Uh, so we're looking at machine learning and artificial intelligence and working on some things as far as portfolio optimization. Uh, again, allowing someone to come in and as simple as saying, hey, I'm bullish or I'm bearish. Okay, uh, how much money are you looking to invest? Okay, got it. You know, what is your general goal? Taking some basic parameters, pl plugging that in, and then suggesting, you know, what are sample portfolios that might fit uh, those general parameters and having that portfolio be dynamic over time and optimized based on changing dynamics uh, in the market. And we feel like that's something, uh, as, as you mentioned, the market's evolving. As new players are coming into the market, and we talked a little bit earlier on a panel about millennials coming into the market, this is something that could very much speak to uh, that, uh, you know, that grow, uh, grouping. And that's my next question as well, mobile technology, how much does that play into the retail platforms right now? Because it seems as if the shift goes from, um, it's going to mobile right now, and you're yeah. seeing less and less desktop trading, which I find fascinating. Absolutely. Uh, the majority, it's, it's parabolic, uh, is particularly trade station. The number of our users uh, that have migrated over to uh, mobile is uh, up considerably, I mean, in one year, one year's time. I mean, we look back to, uh, again, February 5th as an example, and the majority of the orders coming through and option-related orders are all coming through mobile. Now, most of us sitting in this room, and I can remember, you think back 10 years ago, I, I never, ever would have considered placing an order uh, via you know, mobile technology. And now, majority of our traders, that's, that's primarily how they trade the market, is uh, through their phone. Uh, so with us, you know, we're, we're launching almost on a weekly basis now, upgrades to our mobile technology, uh, allowing people with the same power uh, and analytics that they would receive on a desktop, or at least getting them as close as humanly possible to having that so that they can, they can trade the markets when they're away. Tony, I'm sure you agree. You were on the Millennial Mobile Trading Platform, um, panel last year for uh, OIC 2017, so I'm sure you would agree. Yes, absolutely. So the, the whole mobile push is also still under the user experience umbrella of delivering what people want in as simple as, as possible. And just to kind of tie things back a little bit regarding 
Um, the retail space, you know, two things that we really see as a challenge for, for the retail market. Number one is the, the efficiency and transparency of markets is not something that the retail trader has any visibility into. So, P Peter, you talk about, you know, the order quality that your institutional customers get to see. The retail customers don't see any of that at all. Um, and that was one of the biggest challenges we have. You know, the, the problem that we talk about at this conference every year about liquidity on the screen, that's what the, the retail customer sees. They don't have any idea as far as where true liquidity is. And actually, they are the segment of the market that actually can benefit the most if they just simply had a bit more transparency. Things like theoretical value, things like where the true where orders actually are getting um, executed at. This is the type of problems that machine learning can help with and provide transparency to the to the retail market. And, and because we're hearing from retail markets that aren't even attempting to interact with the market because of the quote they see on the screen. They're just assuming that if something's trading at 40 cents by a dollar, I'm just not gonna get, there's no liquidity, I'm not gonna trade it. Um, the, other, the other challenge that we really see in, in this market with respect to user experience is, you know, we've, we've come a long way with mobile, with all the innovations we've done in terms of making options more accessible, but once we get a customer into an option trade, once they've sold their first cover call, once they've bought a call or a put, how do they manage that trade? You know, that education and guidance and tools isn't really readily available for the retail market. Um, it certainly exists on the institutional side, but, you know, we're seeing customers sell a couple of cover calls, but because they don't know how to manage it, they kind of step away from the market again. So that's really some of the things that we're applying machine learning to in terms of portfolio management, like yeah. you said, is you know taking a look at simple rules like when to take profit, when to cut your losses, when to roll your cover calls, that simply doesn't exist. And that's what we're uh, spending our time uh, and our resources on, is ma helping retail customers manage their positions. And if we look at the RIA space, they manage $4 trillion in, 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 in uh, AUM. And this is a, a market segment that doesn't really utilize options as much as they could. And all they need is a little bit of help from technology to help them get started with options trading and more importantly, manage the positions that they're in. Right, particularly that's where the growth in the industry is with, with um, the options trading right now, the Absolutely. RAAs for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, I mean, do you think technology solves all these problems though? Um, technology on itself cannot solve all of them. I think you ha there's absolutely critical that it has to be uh, an education front that goes with it. And I think we're slowly starting to see the merging of education with the technology that's being out that's being put out there. You know, historically, uh, options education was kind of siloed and it was very theoretical and academic. And then we, and then once you learned that and you had to jump to the tools, it wasn't it wasn't an easy transition for people. And now we're slowly starting to merge that where we're teaching using the technologies and the platforms that people actually trade with, and that really helps uh, by leaps and bounds, in my opinion. Pete, does this apply on the institutional side as well? Because when we say institutional, we just don't think of a trading desk, but they'd be asset managers that also sure. require um, education in the options industry as well. Absolutely. I mean, I think it, it, it goes throughout the, uh, you know, th throughout the, um, you know, you know, everybody in the space. I mean, I think that, especially visualization, I think that it's really technology visualization makes things more consumable. If you can see it, you can understand it. And I think that, you know, um, both options play and trade station do, do a great job of that as well. It's just people don't understand that the level, you know, when I came into the business, I, I started on the trading floor and there you could learn everything. You know, and people willing to teach you. That's not available anymore. Everybody's with their phone and the in Starbucks, et cetera. So using visualization technology to give people animations of what's happening, giving them choices, options. You know, this is what generically you want to get short. Okay, here's three ways to do that. Here's a, here's different ways to express that. And I think on the uh, on the institutional side, it's the same thing. I mean, there, people are obviously there's there's less people, there's more technology, and with those people, they need to manage multiple portfolios and, and express themselves in very different ways across different portfolios to achieve different outcomes versus you know, the, the numerous benchmarks out there. So giving them more tools and giving them more sort of shortcuts using technology where they know they're doing the right thing and they're expressing themselves and they understand you know, the profit and loss capabilities and, 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 all, and all the different horizon-based risk parameters, you know, I think makes everything more consumable and that, let, and that creates an environment where they can trade more. Right. You know what I mean? Which obviously benefits. Well, them. it's almost necessary because if you haven't had that formal physical training on a trading floor or a trading desk, you almost need to have it done for you. So it'll be interesting to see where we are 20, 30, 40 years from now when 
people like us are, are no longer in the trading business, but um, we, have, we have a little bit of time left, so let's go and spend a couple of minutes each um, going down the line. In the next five to 10 years, where do you see the business in terms of innovation and technology? Because innovation does spur further innovation. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in first. I think you know, going along the same thing, I think it's, it's visualization and it's really you know, algorithms and smart routers getting smarter using machine learning and AI. And I think we've covered that you know, it kind of almost ad nauseum in this panel at this point. But I think it's really unleashing these new technologies and, and helping people. I don't think that, you know, I think a lot of people are concerned is, is, you know, is it gonna be too many machines and not enough people? There's always gonna be room for talented people in this business and the investment horizon. You know, it's just about equipping that. It's almost like, I think it's like athletes. You know what I mean? Over time, you're gonna get better tennis it's better, better shoes, better everything, and it's just and using the you know visualization to help people control and understand what's going on, improve their investment pro, um, experience, and also give them the tools to perform better. And I think that so I, that's what I think. I think it's it's just really you know helping you know all the professional users and the retail users really make the most out of their capabilities. And I think that there's a it's it's going to be an exciting time in the next five or ten years. All right, and Travis. Yeah. So obviously, again, you know the AI and uh, machine learning space. Uh, but I think as it pertains to the retail uh, investor, again, I, I noted on it uh, when we first started. It's it's going to where the customers at versus having them come to you, uh, and and. My belief, and this may blow your mind, but my belief is that in the next five to ten years, I think inside of the next five years, uh, as far as technology is concerned, um, it's going to be voice and it's going to be chatbots. Uh, as education and the retail investor starts to understand options, starts to understand uh, the basic foundation of what they need uh, to access options and trade their portfolio, uh, you're going to see uh, firms start to launch uh, applications via Alexa, uh, via Facebook chatbots, via all these different avenues uh, to where the, particularly the millennial is living right now to where they're gonna be able to access and trade without ever touching a platform. So replace me with Alexa. No, so we're all gone. We'll yeah, replace me all questions. of us, yeah. All right, and Tony, we'll wrap it up with you. Um, so I think that the industry needs a bit more automation and I think we need to also step back a little bit from all the strategies that you can trade with options. You know, like Henry Schwartz on the first day put up that slide talking about what strategies actually trade, right? It's really sexy to talk about butterflies and condors and all of these complex strategies, but in reality, people trade cover calls, they buy calls and puts, they sell puts, they trade a couple of spreads. Um, but that's, that's the vast majority of, of the volume in options, and I think we need to come back and focus on those and do those strategies really, really well. And we can do it through automation because these are strategies that make sense for a long-term buy and hold equities investor to add to their portfolios, but they're scared of doing it today because they don't necessarily have the right education and tools. Um, and I think this is really where machine learning and automation can really change the game in terms of being able to help every single equity investor to add options to their portfolio through some form of automation uh, doing simple things like cover calls and short puts alone. All right. Well, thank you very much for everyone joining us today. If there are no questions in the audience, we can uh, wrap it up a couple minutes early and get the next panel going. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Great. Thanks, Jill. Appreciate it. Thank you. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.